Welcome to From Betrayal to Breakthrough. I'm Dr. Debbie Silber, and today's guest is Joanna Lin. And Joanna is the founder of the Family Imprint Institute with an international private practice. She's committed to resolving painful patterns from living out in the next generation as if on repeat. The intention with Joanna's work is to contribute to world peace, one family at a time. And I can't wait for you to meet my next guest. She'll be sharing some interesting ideas around how looking at your lineage can be a great indicator, letting you know why you're in a relationship with someone, what you're looking for, the ancestral alarm clock, and how betraying someone may be a subconscious way to bond with a parent. Huh? You'll see what I mean. Listen in. I am so excited because we have Joanna Lynn today. I mean, I could just tell you between the brief chat we just had (laughs) before we went live, it's going to be a very engaging and interesting conversation. So welcome, Joanna. Oh, thanks for having me. It's great to be here with you, Debbie. Just so excited to have you here. So let's just dive right in. From your perspective, what what are the best things to overcome feeling betrayed? Well, I think we've got to be honest with ourselves. You know, there's that first essential sting that comes with it. You know, and maybe we cry, maybe we feel angry. We really get in tune with our feelings. And then once we can release those, that anger, get, a, get beyond that grief, we want to look at our part. I think it's essential to notice, okay, who was I in this relationship? And maybe even more to the point, where was I in time with this? Like, what does this remind me of? Even if it's uncomfortably familiar, how do I begin to sit down in that to really look at what's going on here? I mean, speaking from my own experience, after my ex-husband's affair, I really had, I was so about looking for the freedom beyond the pain. You know, what's the deeper lesson? What's mine to own here? And that's where I could get out of the cycle of blame and anger and hurt. The freedom was just on the other side of that. And I love that you said that because it's so often when we're in that, uh, there's so much pain there and mm. we we want to run from it. We don't want to face it. And and we do have to go through that. And, and you, know, you know that saying, you have to feel it to heal it. And if you run from it, it will chase you until you face it, or at the very least, keep following us into the other, any other future relationships we go into. So what was it for you that made you say, okay, you know what, let me just dive into this and let me take a look at it. I think to be honest with you, it was how deeply that kind of betrayal brought me to my knees. And it was this, I got this metaphor of feeling like that Humpty Dumpty poem where it's like, here I am in pieces. I don't want to put it back together the way it was. And so if I'm going to rebuild this with new pieces, what on earth is that going to look like? And so when I started to look at the influences of my own family, of his family, of some of the compressing factors that were outside of even the relationship, What led us here? How did we get so far? And now who am I going to be on my way back home to myself? Mm. And you know what? It sounds, it sounds like that takes time to get to, because in the, in the very beginning, when there's that shock, we feel like we've been blindsided. What you're saying sounds very rational Mm. and we may not be in that very rational place. So can you walk us through maybe, maybe just even a timeline of, you know, did you come to that the first day or did it take a while or let us, let us know. Yes, certainly not the first day. You know, I think the anger was the first emotion to rise. Um, you know, and that the, the spike of betrayal and the story around that and how could he, and then I think speaking to a very trusting friend who could really hold space for that pain allowed me to even talk out. And then there's sort of these clues that like, okay, right. Even two years ago, there were thoughts in my own, you know, sense of something's not right here, you know, things are off on both sides. Mm -hmm. And now that that is years in my past, I really recognize, especially when I'm working with clients, is the reminder of these days, these things don't happen out of nowhere. You know, there were sort of clues, if you will, looking back, yeah, hindsight is 2020, as they say, but there was a lot that could be noticed and, and really... Uh, clues to the to the demise, if you will. Um, and so once the anger subsided a little bit, the grief took hold. And then this concept of I never want to find myself in this situation again. Mm. So what's my part? And I had to get really, really honest with myself. 
And and the part where you say, what's my part? The, uh, and I think you sort of alluded to that, that some of that takes looking at your family, his family. Talk to us about, because I know that's, that's a lot of your work is taking a look at the families. What, where do we look there? What are we, what are we looking for? Whenever I've got couples that come into my office, the first thing they want to tell me is what he did, what she did, or even recovering after an affair, like my own story. We want to build a case against the other. And the truth is, you know, they say 70% of what goes on in a marriage has to do with each other's family of origin. But I can tell you, the more years I'm in this work, the more I'm convinced it's a lot more like 99%. And so the unconscious relationship we have with our same-sex parents, so for women, it's their mom, and for men, it's their dads, this what we feel like we didn't get enough of from them, we unconsciously project that onto our partner. You know, so if dad was always behind a newspaper and, and the, you know, the current version of that is husband's always on a device or traveling for work, we uh, really feel it even more than just yet another business trip. There's this feeling of you're not there for me. No man has ever been there for me. And so we tend to paint our partner with the same brush for what we didn't receive enough of as a child. Mm. And are there any stories that come to mind that you can share, of course, not names, but where you can mm. share how this absolutely expressed itself from uh, one of your clients and that was their their same-sex parent. Yes, absolutely. So I worked with a client and sadly she lost her mom to alcoholism. She would have been in her early teens, so like 12, 13, such a precarious age to lose a, your mom. And uh, she fell in love with a man who was addicted to not alcohol, sometimes it doesn't look the exact same, but to other things, work, uh, even video games, you know, just this kind of numbing out where that sense is, you're not available to me. And so a lot of the things that she would begin to sort of blame and explain about what go was going on in her marriage was the exact same language she had used to describe what went on for her as a child. And so it's so common in, in my work, we call it the primary scenario. So the things that we felt, the things that we experienced, they actually live out again in our marriage. And until we can take an honest look that, oh, this actually isn't a relationship issue, this has to do with a piece that I need to look at. My partner was just kind of really showing me where that live wire in my body still exists. And so if we can begin to look like our partnerships more in that lens, there's so much more healing available for us. We don't take it as personally, we don't get as hooked. And the most important thing is we get beyond the pattern. Mm. And you know what I love about that? I remember reading, it was it was such an amazing book right when I needed it. It was called Radical Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And right, uh, Colin Tipping, I believe. And it was that people show up and here, it, it's so easy to get angry and upset and furious at these people, but they're showing you or giving you an opportunity to see what still needs to be healed. So it sounds like in this scenario, here it is, this, this client of yours, her mom, uh, you know, was was obviously not doing what she needed or giving her what she needed. And then here's her husband giving her an opportunity to That's see it. what truly needs to be, you know, what she needed in, in that case. So what happens when we get triggered? What do we what do we do? What do we do with that? Well, I think any one of us can lead these ideal lives with peace and harmony or we're sitting on top of a, of a mountaintop meditating away. And I think the true uh, test is getting into relationship and kind of we, we begin to see what's going on within ourselves in reflection of how another person might trigger us or might push our buttons. And so what if we could self-reflect on what that means instead of self-soothe? So for any of us reaching for, okay, I'm going to bury myself in work, or I'm going to down a bottle of wine tonight, or I'm going to, you know, go out and just complain to my friends, because that can be another way that we distract from our own self-responsibility is, you know, everything's out there, everything's somebody else's situation. And so when we are triggered, I had, um, I was reading a book and, and the line stuck out to me. It's like, where am I in time with you? in this mm -hmm. argument where I dig my heels in and I get locked in my position? You know, am I that angry teenager? Am I that toddler that's having a meltdown? You know, how do I really look at what's being triggered in me by what's been said over there 
so that I get to get myself out of this triggered place, not waiting for the other person to say sorry or acknowledge their part. My gosh, we could be prisoners of that for for ages Mm -hmm. if we're waiting for the other side to have that kind of acknowledgement. Yeah. So this is really about taking responsibility. And, you know, you said about getting into relationships and I I just want to um, just unpack that a little bit because there's the getting back into relationships because the truth is you see what shows up and you see who you are and, and what you haven't healed and worked on when you are in a relationship. But I also want to caution, uh, I want to caution the listeners not to jump back into a relationship too soon. Um, do you agree with that? I do. I think we can really notice how we are in relationship with how we are in our friendships. You know, who we are in our family is how we come to work. You can even notice it in your colleagues. I think that until we've really recognized, aha, this was the part I brought in to the relationship that kind of exploded in front of my face, we're less likely to recreate that in the next relationship. So how do I look at those discerning factors? You know, sometimes I think through the heartbreak, do we really learn this is okay for me in relationship and this is an absolute deal breaker? And sometimes we need enough space and time to let all that discernment come to the surface so we're not rushing back in in the guise that we'll learn more about ourselves on the way. Sometimes Mm. we've got to take care of that tender heart of ours. Oh, absolutely. That's so true that you're saying that. And I I really want everybody listening to understand that that when you're out of a relationship or when there's, you know, there's been... a crisis or some kind of trauma, it's such a beautiful opportunity to heal what needs to be healed and do the growing that you need so that when you feel ready, you're not playing in the same pool anymore. You're resonating at a very different level. You want something more because of what you see now so clearly. Oh, exactly. I think my greatest growth period in life was after my divorce, you know, two full years of really understanding and reading books. A book that really stuck out to me at that time was Spiritual Divorce by Debbie Ford. Oh, wow. Before getting in my relationship now, we've been, we just celebrated 12 years together. Mm -hmm. And so I was diving into a different pool, you know, well said. Yeah. Wonderful. So what were some, during those, let's talk about that two year period. What were you, what were some things that you were working on? Was it a conscious thing? Like I want to make sure that I feel, you know, a certain thing or I show up a certain way. It was a conscious thing. I think even just who I am as a person, I've always been really curious about, you know, why we're drawn to certain people or, you know, why certain habits are so hard to break. I was, I'm very curious about people by nature. And so it was really motivated by the pain of not wanting to be involved with, um, with somebody that betrayal could happen again. Um, or certainly this, noticing friends who are struggling with co-parenting with someone who had such different values. So for me, it was very motivated about what could a healthy relationship look like so I don't go down that same painful path. And for me, that's really how I stumbled across the work I do now, this concept of all that we inherit from our family of origin, this intergenerational imprint. And now we know through science, you know, none of us arrive with a clean hard drive. We're very much sharing an operating system with our parents and our grandparents, including their beliefs and perceptions, how their relationship went. Think about it like just as the knee-jerk response in your body. That's your go-to. That's your reference point. And until we look at that, we're kind of running on autopilot otherwise. And what are some things that you've seen that are inherited that may lead someone or may, may make them more likely to either be betrayed or to betray? Mm. Are there certain things that you see? So what I see is if we've had a a partner, a male partner, it could be either or, let's face it, betrayal goes both ways. But I was just thinking of a case where um, the husband was very much estranged and judged his own dad for having affairs with his mom, on his mom. And he was the one home to see the tears and to, you know, basically step into dad's foot, footsteps and have to carry on that responsibility well before his time. And so now in a way he loses access to his dad because he judges him so much for hurting his mom. And in that act of rejection, we've got real something that's very unexpected that tends to happen where unconsciously he says, dad, you're not going to be the bad guy alone. I'm going to cheat too. 
Oh, and so wow. there's an unconscious loyalty that binds father and son or mother daughter, uh, and sometimes it can happen across as well, where a mom or a daughter notices this about her father. And it really just depends on birth order and relationship that child has with the parent. That, see, that is so surprising because my initial you know, thinking to that would be, wow, I see how much pain my mom is in. I would never do that. I would never do anything to cause that pain. But you're saying it's a way to bond with the father. It's unconscious, highly unconscious. And what we reject, we embody. So if we reject a parent, because I mean, we are half that parent. If we reject them, unconsciously, we find a way to even the playing field. Wow, that's an interesting mm-hmm. one. So what would be another example of so something like that? Sometimes it even lives outside of the example of betrayal. But let's say a mom is anxious. A child is often quite anxious. Or I had a very interesting case. I was working with a lawyer and he had mismanaged his practice and came into all kinds of financial difficulty and was on the verge of bankruptcy when we spoke. So we're dealing a lot with his shame and his, how could I let this happen? And what am I going to do for my family? He still had two young kids to put through school. He happened to be 47 at the time of our session. I did some family history work. And it turned out that his father at 47 gambled away the family's money, all of the money. And so he lost his dad at that time. So dad's 47, makes some series of bad uh, money decisions, puts the family in a very precarious situation. This boy never sees or speaks to his dad again. So there's this estrangement his whole life. Now, this happens so commonly, we actually have a name for it. It's called an ancestral alarm clock. So things are going along fairly well for this lawyer client. He hits that age of 47 and everything goes sideways. Wow. And so for him, the ability to understand there were greater forces at play. I think if all of your listeners could take away the one thing from our time together is to recognize how many things are influencing us from behind the scenes. You know, the decisions we make in business, how we show up in relationship. And when we start to give a little more attention to those invisible factors, we begin to have more context. So for him, he could let go of so much of the shame. He could think, okay, well, I've just got to get things back on track. And I realized this is how I'm bonding with my dad. I couldn't bond with him in love or in any other way. So now I take what I've judged him for and I find a way to kind of walk in those same, that same path. What was the name of that again? You said, un, was it unconscious alarm clock? What was the um, name? So it's an unconscious loyalty. Was oh, the unconscious. First okay. about, and this one is an ancestral alarm clock. Okay. That is just yeah. brilliant. That's just brilliant. So now is this, could this be the same thing as I, you hear it so often where someone, let's say at a certain age, a parent gets a disease and they're so afraid that mm. they may get sick around that time and then they do? Is that similar? Is, or is so that I've a different- seen that many times in my practice, but what I see amplifies the likelihood of that is if we don't have a good love flowing between parent and child. Mm. So we're much more likely to carry what's broken or what we've judged in the parent if we don't have a good relationship where we can receive love like they give it. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so interesting. So talk to us about narcissists, because that's something that I've heard and, and learned that that can be the kind of thing that we may have had a narcissistic parent and then it's familiar, you know? And That's it. It's sort of, this is how love is. I take care of everything. They're focused on themselves and I'll just do the rest. And so whenever, you know, someone will come in and say, oh my gosh, my mom is such a narcissist or I could never get my dad's attention. He was always so consumed with his own stuff. Well, I get very curious because to me, a narcissist means they don't have their mom or dad behind them. And so oftentimes when we don't feel like somebody's got our back, we become like hungry ghosts out here. We want to lean into our partner, even leaning into our own kids. And we make everything about us because it was never enough about us as kids. Trying to make up for lost time in a sense. Mm. And so how to get out of a relationship with a narcissist or how to balance things if you are in love with one is to really look at the influences of how they're trying to fill a hole 
that's been there probably for since as long as they could remember. And and that puts the the person on the other end in a tough spot because let's say they had a narcissistic parent, they didn't receive whatever they needed because the narcissistic parent needed uh, the attention or whatever. So that the 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 child is now looking for that attention. And then they wind up with a narcissist because that's what's familiar. So now they're like never getting what they need. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a way to break that pattern. And so if you find yourself as a listener with narcissistic behavior, my invitation for you would be to start noticing what is it that I can give to myself, whether that be booking a massage or heading out into nature with the intention of Mom, Dad, I trust you would have given more to me if more had been given to you. And then every time I can give that to myself, that's how we'll stay close. That's how I really live in gratitude for this beautiful life you've given to me. And I stop expecting you to give me anything more. I now give that to myself because I know best what I need. And then it's more in our conscious awareness and we can stop that you know, leaning into others, expecting that they will pick up the slack. We begin to fill that empty hole with our own, you know, our own intention, our own awareness of what we need. And, and that is just wonderful advice with a parent where we're just not expecting. What happens when we're co-parenting with a narcissist and we do need them for certain things? Let's say just help with the kids. What yeah, do you suggest that, then? That's a very real example. I, I deal with that a lot in my practice. And so I think the best place that you can come from when you look at your co-parent who may be a narcissist is to look behind him. So what are the influences? What do you know about you know, your, your in-laws, your ex-in-laws, as to what shaped him to be the way he is? The more compassion, the more understanding we can come from, it actually has the ability to grow our patients. And we're doing this not for the ex, we're doing this for our children. Children do best with equal access to both parents. And the last thing we want is our children to be on our side against their own father. This is a huge detriment to kids and like and amplifies the likelihood that they'll show up in a similar relationship. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna stop you right there. That is so powerful because it's so easy when we're angry and we've been hurt to just you know we we may very likely be telling the truth. This is just what happened. But those kids listening are hearing it from a very different lens, and the That's damage it. that it's doing to them. And they don't, um, with all due respect, deserve the truth of what's going on in the marriage because it's none of their business. In the best way possible, I say that you know this is where they receive the gift of their life from. This is not for them to say mommy's right or daddy's mean or mommy's crying. You know, we want to keep them outside of the adult dynamics of whatever's going on inside their relationship um, in order to give them equal access to both parents. We don't want, you know, our son to be seeing their dad through the eyes we see him through. That's grown up stuff and belongs with us. But I, I have to say, I've seen it because I work with with many of the women uh, who've who've been betrayed, and they're they're protecting. And this is very common in the study that I did, where where uh, the betrayers were protected. And what I saw repeatedly was the women were so sick; they had so many physical symptoms because they were uh, they were all alone in this and carrying this burden and in protecting their betrayer, it was like an extra, just something that was eating them up alive. Mm. So how do you make sense or peace out of that one? And so tell me an example of how that lives in co-parenting. What do you mean protecting the betrayer? What does that look like? Yeah. Like where they, the, uh, let's say I'm thinking of one example where, um, let's say she had him leave the house when she found out about his string of affairs mm -hmm. and then took the responsibility when they were like, well, why did dad leave? Mm. And made it like it was her decision. Okay. So that shows a little bit of likely family history on her side. Mm. And so we want to be able to be as neutral and honest as we can. So it might look something like, 
mom and dad are going through adult stuff right now. And we need a little bit of space from each other. And I can't tell you how it's going to turn out because we don't know yet. But what I can tell you is mom and dad both love you and we're both available to you. Mm -hmm. And then for the person who's trying to do it all on their own, how do we reach out, whether it's uh, their own parent, their friends, how do we create a, a network in the community to be sure it doesn't all rest on our own shoulders? You know, that old saying, it takes a village. You know, I still stand by that. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. That that is a time where we need so much support, and we're the least likely to to res- to look for it because we just don't want to burden anyone. We're humiliated, embarrassed, ashamed, but that's yeah. when we need yeah. it the most. We're just so, reeling from the situation at hand. Yeah, yeah. Joanna, what do you want to make sure everybody knows before we wrap up? I think to really recognize there is freedom on the other side that betrayal doesn't have to be the end of your story. And perhaps it's the start of a brand new book with all kinds of new experiences. And so make it like a learning experience that opens the door to something better. Beautiful. And I know you have a unique way that you help people do that. Could you just real quickly tell us about that? Yeah. So as you can tell from our conversation, my work is kind of digging in to how you've been imprinted by your family and understanding the other side, your partner's side, even if it's not about reconciliation, but it's about, oh, wow, maybe it wasn't personal. Geez. You know, there was this invisible influence that led a lot of these choices And I can come to understand it wasn't just about me being disrespected. There was more at play. And I think that alone helps to lessen the pain that can be held on, you know, for years, if not for decades. What I want to do with my clients is put the pain to bed as soon as possible so we can get on with creating that new chapter. Oh, that's so beautiful. And how do we learn more about you? Where do we go? Well, certainly visit my website at www.joannalynn.ca and it has a unique spelling. If it's okay, I'll spell that. Please do. J-O-H-A-N-N-A-L-Y-N-N.ca because I'm over here in Canada. (laughs) Joanna, you gave us such great information and I know the listeners are, uh, they have a lot to chew on with this because it is so easy. The blame game, you know, it's just so easy to do. But when we take a look at our, at our families and our histories and maybe see what still needs to be healed. And maybe that's why we chose that person. uh, We can do a lot of healing and a lot of growing, which is so helpful. Anything else you just want to say before we wrap up? Well, just as you said that, I thought of a therapist I saw back in the day and he said to me, you know, blame is the cheapest hit of power going and it's going to keep you stuck. So oh, how do we God. use it as a catalyst instead? Beautiful. Let's wrap up there. I don't think it can get any better. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna, thank you so much. I, I just, I know the listener's going to get so much out of this. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Didn't you just love Joanna? I learned so much about some of those invisible factors we inherit and how they play out in our relationships. The good news, once you become aware of what you're doing, you can do something about it. Stay in touch with Joanna by visiting her at joannalynn.ca and we'll have her information in the show notes at pbtinstitute.com forward slash podcast. Here's my biggest takeaway. Most of what we're doing is the result of subconscious programming. We can have those knee-jerk reactions or we can instead choose to be more conscious and aware of what we're inheriting so we keep the good stuff and change the rest. It's up to us. And here's a gift from me. Head over to pbtinstitute.com to receive my gift of how your biggest crisis reveals your greatest gift and let us support you. Go to Facebook and join our group, Women Hacking Betrayal, where we give information, tools, and support to help you move forward and heal once and for all. Can't wait to be with you next time. And here's to your breakthrough.